Hello and welcome back to Professional Responsibility. You remember me? I'm your friendly neighborhood Bar Grievance Defense Attorney Patrick John McGinley here to talk to you about the model rules of professional conduct, helping you take a deeper dive so that you can be ready for the multi-state professional responsibility exam. This is lesson eight and our theme today is diligence and competence. Speaking of diligence and competence, that light is blaring. I can hardly see the monitor. Let me try turning off the light and see if that makes our video better. Sorry for the interruption, but it could pay off. I'll be right back. I don't see how the screen's any better, but I'm in the dark. <laughs> so, so much for that. Let me try old light back on and current on light turned off. Be right back. I think that's better. At least it's my intent that it be. All right, so let me pretend to start. Hello everyone, welcome back. You remember me, I'm Patrick John McGinley, your friendly neighborhood bar grievance defense attorney here to talk to you about professional responsibility, specifically focusing on the model rules of professional conduct. We're taking a deeper dive into those rules to help you pass the multi-state professional responsibility exam with flying colors. And the theme of our presentation today is competent, diligent representation. Now, it seems to me that you wouldn't need rules about such things. Who among us enters a prof profession and decides not to be competent? Likewise, who enters a profession and wants to be anything less than diligent? Nevertheless, our rules of professional responsibility address competence and diligence in the usual ways and sometimes in some surprising ways. As you might guess, when it comes to something like the MPRE, multi state. So, what exactly will we be covering today? I've got that broken down for you here on the big board. First, we'll be looking at four different rules from chapter one. Chapter one of the uh, ABA rules. Chapter one talks about the client lawyer relationship. So, we're going to be looking at four particular rules from chapter one. One of those rules we'll be looking at is rule 1.1 that talks about competence. We'll also be looking at rule 1.3 that talks about diligence. 1.4 talks about communications. And when it comes to competence and diligence, you really can't get there without adequate communication. So let's cover that rule when we cover the other two. And we're going to cover not all of, but a good chunk of rule 1.8, focusing mostly on subsection H, as you will see as our lecture progresses. So with our theme of competent, diligent representation, those four rules are our main focus. But we're also going to touch upon part of chapter three. Chapter three talks about our duties as an advocate. We're going to focus on those in a later lecture. But as for today's lecture, we are going to talk about one of those particular rules in chapter three that applies only to one particular type of representation. And that is your role, if you have it, as the prosecutor in a criminal case. So this particular rule that we're going to look at, rule 3.8, talks about the special responsibilities that apply to a criminal law prosecutor. Also tied into our theme of competent, diligent representation are two other rules that come from chapter five. Chapter five talks about law firms and associations. There we're going to take a look at rule 5.1, the responsibilities of a partner or supervisory lawyer. And we'll also look at the other side of that same coin. Rule 5.2 talks about responsibilities of a subordinate lawyer. So when you can't talk about one without the other, right? So we'll look at 5.1, the, the partner and supervisory lawyers, and we'll also look at 5.2, which talks about the subordinate lawyers. And by touching on all these rules, we will be keeping with our theme, competent, diligent representation. With that theme in mind, let's get right to work, shall we? Let's talk about 
Hello, I'm back. <laughs> Let's talk about, oh, I got some canned laughter in the background. That's so nice. Uh, let's talk about rule 1.2, and that has to do with competence. One of the things that competence requires is the appropriate tools. So if you intend to read your own notes and you need reading glasses, competence would require you to put them on. So that's what I'm going to do. Sorry that the lights bounce off the glass of the glasses, but that's part of the nature of glasses. Okay, competence. What talks about there is that in order to represent a client, you have to represent the client competently. If you fail to represent the client competently, then you are incompetent. No surprises yet, right? Now, incompetence has its consequences. Indeed, a book that I very much enjoy, I always have nearby. This is an older edition, but this is Ethical Lawyering by a professor named Paul Hayden. Never met him. I spent lots of time <laughs> reading and annotating his book, and he calls this particular chapter Incompetence and Its Consequences. Ouch! Kind of harsh, right? But Professor Hayden has a point. If indeed your level of representation of the client sinks below the level of competence, in other words, if you're incompetent, then there are consequences to pay the least of which would be a violation of the model rules of professional conduct. The worst of which would be to find yourself financially liable as a fiduciary, as the lawyer of a client of whom you provided incompetent representation. That is negligence. That is malpractice. That is actionable. And that is something to be avoided. How do we avoid it? Well, if you're a law student, you're already hard at work avoiding it. You're studying, you're learning, you're doing the very best you can. And that's the kind of thing a lawyer must do throughout the lawyer's career, with very few exceptions. Matter of fact, it may just be one exception. But with very few exceptions, no matter what bar you join of the 50 states or the District of Columbia or the territories of the U.S., be to get and learn and attend and fulfill a continuing legal education requirement, one that has to be met and one that you should want to meet because the times they are changing, to coin a phrase, I just made that up. No, I didn't. But the times they are changing always. The only thing that doesn't change is change because change always comes. So you've got to keep up on the law as you continue your practice. You know, I, when I graduated Florida State back in 1996, I knew the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure like the back of my hand. I think I still do, but I can tell you this one thing. The Florida Rules of Civil Procedure that I know today don't look a whole lot like the Rules of Civil Procedure did back in 1996. They change. Here in Florida, Rules of Procedure on a two-year cycle, there's committees that meet and they propose changes on a two-year cycle and they can be changed in between cycles and changes occur, whether the changes occur as the change of a statute enacted by a legislature or a change of a court rule, sometimes case law precedent makes changes in the law. And as a diligent lawyer, as a competent lawyer, you've got to be able to research and learn these things. But legal knowledge and skill, what exactly do the model rules of professional conduct require when they say that? Are you only allowed to practice within your specialty? No. As soon as you pass a bar exam and you're licensed to practice in that particular jurisdiction, that is a license to do most anything. Most anything. Are there exceptions? Yes, they're few and far between. There are certain areas of the law that require certain court affiliations or passing a certain exam. I'm thinking of patent lawyers have to pass the patent bar. Can't even sit for the patent bar last time I checked unless you had an adequate uh, scientific or STEM undergraduate degree. Or you could make up for that last time I checked with a particular master's degree in a STEM or science field. Without that background, without passing that test, you can't practice patent law. But other than something so specific that a rule or a law has been carved out to make an exception, other than those exceptions, the general rule is that as soon as you pass the bar, you are competent to practice anything. 
you know, I used to love to put a question on an exam that went something like this. You know, uh, pick, pick a name of uh, Sally, Eddie, lawyer, attorney, hypothetically, uh, flunks the bar several times and then learns of a passage, learns that they passed at the same time that they happened to be watching TV and there was an advertisement for a dentist. The lawyer then takes this as a sign that they're supposed to go into dental malpractice work, even though they never studied that topic in school, even though they never read a book on it, even though they've never been to the dentist. <laughs> is a lawyer allowed to do that? And the answer is yes, assuming the lawyer is willing to put in the adequate studies, read the books, maybe even align with the lawyer who knows how to do that already. But competent representation can be done at any level of experience. Indeed, the rules say something along the lines of that uh, a new lawyer can be just as competent as an experienced lawyer. That's a paraphrase from the official comment to official rule 1.1 of the model rules of professional responsibility. So please don't be discouraged and think, ah, just got out of law school, not competent to do anything. Yes, you are. You're legally almost competent to do anything. So remember, that's what the rules say. Expertise in a particular field of law can be required in certain circumstances. How do you make up for that expertise? One of the things you can associate with another lawyer who knows that, you might join a uh, voluntary bar. Sometimes even within the mandatory bar that you have to be a member of, there will be sections. There could be the labor and employment section. There could be the patent law section. There never seen one, but there could be a uh, section for bar grievance defense attorneys. Uh, I've never seen that as part of an organized bar. But there are also voluntary bars, like there's a group called APRL that call them, pronounce their APRL abbreviation as APRIL, Association of Professional Responsibility Lawyers. So that's a voluntary bar organization. And you can join that and you can associate or rub elbows with your fellow practitioners in your particular field, and you can gain competence and expertise in that way. So that's a great idea. What about an emergency? Emergencies happen. Hypothetically, I don't know, your, your cousin's nephew gets arrested and can't reach another lawyer except you, but you did nothing more than take the mandatory first year law school criminal law class and have never touched criminal law again in the next 10 or 12 years of your practice. Can you get up in the middle of the night and go to your cousin's brother's nephew's first appearance in an emergency? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Emergencies are allowed. Uh, the thing you want to watch out for in emergencies is whether or not it's a true emergency. And the other thing you want to watch out for is when's the emergency over? You know, it's one thing to say it's an emergency in the middle of the night. I better be there on the first appearance. But should you continue to be lead chair all the way through the capital criminal offense trial? Probably not. So the emergency is an exception, but it's a limited one. Another thing to watch out for is preparation. You've got to be able and willing to do the preparation. Nowadays, it seems to be at our fingertips, doesn't it? We all carry around cell phones or iPhones or Android phones or smartphones in our pockets. They have the computing power greater than computers had five years ago. What do we use them for? Well, usually to watch cat videos, but other things can be done with these smartphones in our pockets, such as a Google search, such as a go, go, duck, 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 go search, whoever Google's competitor is. Do they have a competitor? Seems like a monopoly. I digress. But do the search and get the information. You can do it. You may even want to sign up for one of these, Westlaw or Lexis or Bloomberg or whatever it is that you want to sign up to have what you might consider better information. But hey, the publicly available information seems to be getting better and better all the time. Hmm. <laughs> so that's something to watch out for there. Now, what if you want to represent the client, but it's a complex case? You've got your area that you're comfortable in, but that particular legal need of that particular client implicates other areas that you're less comfortable in. Does it violate the rules of competence to take on such a client? No, it does not. And one of the ways you can be sure not to violate 
the rules of competence is to reach an agreement in advance with that particular client as to what you're going to do for her or him. It is permissible to have an agreement between the lawyer and the client that limits the scope of the representation. You want to be careful with that. The client has to knowingly consent to this. And there has to be a clear division as to what you're doing for the client and what you're not doing for the client. Clear enough that the client understands it. Putting in a writing, excellent idea. But just because it's in writing doesn't mean that it's clear. We've all read writings that are not clear. So it's got to be a clear division of responsibilities when it comes to this written agreement with the client that limits the matters for which you are responsible. Another thing, retaining or contracting with other lawyers. Remember the implications of that in some of the other rules that we've covered already and some that we will cover soon. They're not the specific topics for today, but remember rule 1.2 that we're talking about here, uh, that we haven't talked about here, talks about the allocation of authority. And when you're going to allocate that between attorneys, likewise, just when you limit the scope of representation, you've got to be abundantly clear as to who is responsible for what. How does that old cliche go? When everyone's responsible for a task, that means no one's responsible, right? You have to avoid that situation when it comes to allocating tasks between you and a co-counsel or your firm and another firm or your group and another group of lawyers. And that's true whether that co-counsel or fellow lawyer is within your firm or is outside your firm. Another rule you have to watch out for is 1.5 sub E. That's going to talk about fee sharing. We're going to have a separate lecture on fees, but note for now that you're going to have to make that clear and comply with that rule. 1.6 talks about confidentiality. Again, subject of another lecture, but note for now that despite the fact that that firm does this and your firm does that, Every firm is bound by the duty of confidentiality that is owed to that client. Don't forget Rule 5.5 sub A. That talks about the unauthorized practice of law. Obviously, it goes without saying, you're not going to delegate legal tasks to a non-lawyer who's not under your direct supervision that you're not directly supervising, that you're not participating in, signing off on, editing, revising, and confirming their work. Make sure you don't associate with a lawyer who violates that rule. So those are some things to remember. Maintaining competence. Competence is something that can be fleeting, like your teeth. You ignore your teeth, they'll go away. If you ignore your competence, it too will go away. So keep up on whatever it is that you want to be the expert in. Another cliche, the cliches are flying today, talks about a jack of all trades as master of none. That can be true in any field. That can be true and when it comes to practicing law. You may wish to be a general practitioner. That's a respectable choice. That's a wonderful field. That's a much needed type of specialty. Or you might decide that you want to focus on a particular specialty. If you make that decision, then become the expert your client needs you to be and keep up. Attend the continuing legal education classes. Read the latest in that particular field. Be the best. Your clients deserve nothing less than the best. So that covers rule 1.1 that talks about competence. Along with that comes rule 1.3. That talks about diligence. Diligence is the part of competence that has to do with commitment. Diligence is the part of competence that has to do with dedication. Diligence is the part of competence that has to do with zeal. Zeal. Be a zealous advocate of your client and your client's positions. Uh, one part of the model rules that I liked in their comment reads like this. A lawyer should pursue a matter on behalf of a client despite opposition, despite obstruction, or despite personal inconvenience to the lawyer, and take whatever lawful and ethical measures are required, commitment, dedication, and zeal. You know, one way our clients might be tempted to get justice is to take matters into their own hands. 
street justice, if you will, literal fighting, if you will, their lawyers and their legal profession. So what I would encourage you is to be committed, to be that zealous advocate of your client because your clients need that. They need it. You know, that doesn't mean rule 1.3 requiring you to act with reasonable diligence and promptness. That doesn't mean that you have to turn every transaction, negotiation, or litigation into an out-and-out street brawl. For example, it was many years ago. Wow, my son wasn't born yet, so it's more than a decade ago. I'm at a mediation. I was doing much more workers' compensation defense back then than I'm doing now. And I was at a, what I thought was a routine mediation with a Daytona Beach lawyer, and I knew him very well, knew him for years. And to my surprise at the initial discussion of the mediation when we're all gathered in one room before the mediator separated us, he literally stood up and he's literally looking, fuming mad and he's moving and enunciating and he's shouting and he's banging on the table. I had not seen him act like that before. So, you know, bizarre behavior in my opinion. And he left the room and I wasn't more than a minute into my discussion with my client about how this wasn't, this Daytona Beach lawyer's particular usual behavior and how I'd known him for years that we'd always gotten along, which he peeked in back into the room. He'd left with his client and now he peeked his head back into the room. He says, oh, hey, Pat, I'm sure you knew this already, but I was just posturing for my client. She's real angry at yours. She wanted me to put up a tough guy fight. Nothing personal, right? And, you know, uh, when I look back at that, of course, I laugh. I hope you did, too. But I also, when I look back at that, I see the lack of necessity there. You know, you'll always be in situations where your client feels some emotions, probably anger, might even feel that they're taken advantage of. And you'll always have that pressure upon you to do what that Daytona Beach lawyer did, to be the tough guy, to be like in a street brawl. But is that the kind of lawyer you want to be? Is that what our profession is all about? And I would argue that it is not. You know, we need to rise above. We need to act with professionalism. We need to be the diplomatic and professional alternative to a street brawl and a fight, but never, never, never. Do we give up our zeal? Do we give up our dedication? Do we give up our passion? You can be zealous, dedicated, diligent, competent, and impassioned without degrading our profession into a street fight. So that's the point I'd hope to make with that story, which may or may not have been true. Names changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> anyway, when it talks about uh, diligence in Model Rule 1.3. The comments raise some great issues. One of the issues talks about courtesy and respect. And, you know, in my hypothetical there, which may have been a real story, maybe that day Turner Beach lawyer forgot about courtesy and respect, but certainly took some acts to repair it, right? When he peeked back in the room, made sure everything was still copacetic between us. So if you have that moment where you lack courtesy and respect, Maybe you can make amends, but courtesy and respect is not something you have to put aside and forget about and throw out the window in order to be zealous, in order to be dedicated, in order to be committed, in order to be impassioned. Those things can all go together with courtesy and respect. Another issue that the comments raise talks about the lawyer's workload. There are situations sometimes where it's a blessing. It's a blessing. The lawyer has more work to do than hours in the day. That happens. So diligence requires that you get your workload under control. That might mean turning down a new case, God forbid. It might mean, Lord willing, hiring more people. One of the beautiful things that our profession can be is employers, entrepreneurs, job makers, if you've got more work than you can do, now's the time to get a paralegal. Now's the time to get your paralegal and assistant. Now's the time to think about an associate or partner to expand the firm and to have more employees and to make jobs 
good jobs for your community. Don't forget to offer benefits. People deserve benefits. So workload is something to watch out for. Another thing that can help you manage workload is the technology. Uh, I'm not saying just form generating form work. Never been a big fan of these form generators or just using forms. What I'm talking about there is that the some sorts of programs make your life easier. Some of them make your life harder. There are certain word processors that just make it harder to generate work. Some word processors, however, make it easier. Same thing with case management systems, with these databases that are, some of them need so much personalization and maintenance. They're more bothered than they're worth. Some of them, however, work great out of the box in the cloud and make your life easier. So technology is another way you can assure diligence and competence. Another uh, issue that's talked about here in the model rules and their official comments talks about procrastination. I was going to talk about procrastination earlier, but I just didn't get around to it. Uh -huh. Get it? Eh, anyway. <laughs> okay, procrastination can be a problem. Look, we're lawyers because we love to practice law. But there's other things we love to do, right? Like for me, I love to write. I love to write a book. I love to work on my writing. Procrastination. Sometimes I put off my writing. Sometimes I put off a case. More times than not, Lord willing, I see that I'm procrastinating and I step in and I do something about it. If you find yourself not checking your own procrastination, not stopping your own procrastination, then you've got to find a means to help you along. I once knew a professional who never liked to work alone, always liked to work physically side by side with someone because that professional felt the peer pressure, I guess you would call it, of not procrastinating. Hey, if that's you, then, then find a partner, hire a secretary who's willing to put up with being in your physical presence. Do whatever it takes to beat procrastination. In a worst case scenario, procrastination leads to missing something like a statute of limitations where your client's rights have been lost due to a missed deadline or a lack of timeliness. We can't have that. That is not competent representation. That's certainly not diligent. And that is more often than not negligent. It's malpractice. So you've got to watch out for such things. And again, the software can help. The calendaring can help. The assistance can help. A lot of us come to law school without the particular experience of managing a project, breaking it down into steps, scheduling each step to have adequate time and getting the preliminary steps done in time so that the later steps can be done. If that's not a skill you have, then team up with someone who has it and get yourself some good case management software that helps to compensate for that particular skill. Because a lot of things turn out to be a project. A negotiation can turn out to be a project. Litigation certainly turns out to be a project. Project management skills are part of diligence. Another thing we talk about here is that it's not a violation of diligence or competence to grant a reasonable request for a postponement. There are so many times where opposing counsel just needs a break, just needs a few extra days, and it's not a violation of diligence or competence to give a professional courtesy of a meaninglessly short extension of time that doesn't compromise your client's case and doesn't interfere with your client achieving your client's objectives. You can do that. That's not a violation to be polite. You can grant such a request. It's in the model rules and it's just good practice. It really is. Let's talk about rule 1.4 and rule 1.4 there, you talk about communication. So let's talk about talking. Oh, the jokes are hilarious today, aren't they? No, they're not, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> communication is important. And why is it so important? Well, statistics tell us that the number one reason, the number one reason that clients file bar grievances against their lawyers, the most popular reason, the most common reason is bad communication, such as client calls, lawyer doesn't happen to be there. Client leaves a message, lawyer doesn't happen to get it. Client calls again, lawyer's busy, says, oh, um, take a message. Client, lawyer doesn't return that message either. 
finally the client feels so frustrated with the lawyer and the lawyer's firm, they got to turn to someone. And who do they turn to? They turn to the bar. And what does the bar do? Well, it depends on your state bar. Some of them, like Florida, have the ACAP, the Attorney Consumer Assistance Program, which will proactively step in and try to resolve the problem without discipline. That's great when they do it, but they're not required to do it. Some states never even try to do it. A simple customer service problem can turn into a professional responsibility problem just like that. So you've got to communicate with your client. And indeed, there are times in the rules where informed consent is required. And there, if you fail to communicate with your client, what you've done there is created a professional responsibility problem. Other times, uh, you have to communicate when it comes to the objectives of the litigation. Generally speaking, the objective of the litigation is to be decided by the client. Generally speaking, the means by which the client's objectives are determined may be determined by the lawyer. What do I mean by that? When it comes to why there's the litigation or transaction, what for you're litigating or transacting, what is to be achieved by the litigation or transaction, those objectives, that's the client's decision, the client's alone. So you obviously need to communicate with your client sufficiently to know what those objectives are and to keep yourself up to date in case those objectives change. Some clients, their objectives are a moving target constantly, moving around. You've got to keep track of where it went. You have to try to follow it as it moves. And that's part of communication. Now, when it comes to the means by which you achieve the client's goals, the client's choices of objectives, the lawyer has far much more discretion. The lawyer has a duty to keep the client informed about those means. And in certain circumstances, might have to have a conversation before choosing the means, not always. But got to keep the client informed. So although you're not asking the client's permission per se, in advance, not always, you do have to keep the client informed about the means by which you're achieving the client's goals. So even though the client might not be making the call, you still have to call the client, let them know what call you made, stated somewhat differently. Even if the client isn't the decider, George W. Bush, I learned that word from you, is not the decider of a particular issue, you still have to give a telephone call or an email or a conversation or a meeting so that the client is up to date on what you decided when it comes to the means of achieving their objectives. So that's what the model rule is talking about there. You got to keep the client reasonably informed, both as to the progress of the case and as to the likelihood of success or failure. That's particularly true in litigation. Part of my experience over the past 24 years, part of it has been in the past, having worked for insurance companies. And as an insurance defense lawyer, if you are one, I'm sure you can relate. At every step of the litigation on a regular basis, they want a new updated status report with a new exposure evaluation. Oh, you took a doctor's deposition. Okay, update my future financial exposure report. What's the likelihood of winning or losing? How much financial exposure Am I in for? Oh, now they've hired an expert and you've got their report. Okay, update the future financial exposure report. Send me a new one. Tell me what the likelihood of success or failure is. What is the worst case scenario? How much might I be in for? And the insurance company wants an update again and again and again. And they're proactive enough to ask for it. A lot of clients aren't, but still need that information. It may not be as formal for certain clients. You may not have the spreadsheet and the report and the analysis and the deposition summary that rambles on and on for pages. It looks like a high school book report. It may be more of a quick email. It may be more of a meeting with the client and answering their questions. It may be more of a telephone conference, but you've got to keep them up to date on these types of issues while litigation remains pending. And you know, litigation doesn't always move that fast. It can be years. So you're in for the long haul. You got to be efficient about keeping your client up to date. Again, technology can help. Technology can help. Another issue that is raised there talks about settlement in a civil matter or 
a proffered plea bargain in a criminal matter. Whether it's a criminal matter with a plea bargain or a civil matter with a settlement offer, you've got a duty to make a timely report and, and they offered you $2,000. You're tempted to say to yourself, you know, my case is with a gazillion dollars. I just got an offer for $2,000. The way the client is going to take this. I don't know if I'll bother to call. You have to bother to call. You're required to send the email. You're required to have the meeting. You're required to write a letter or somehow relay the settlement offer and to do so in a timely fashion. Got to do that with every plea bargain, every settlement offer, no matter how unlikely it is that your client wants to accept it. So that's something you need to know for practice. And it's something you see quite a bit when it comes to exam scenarios. So it's something I wanted to be sure to hand, point out. Now, another issue raised in the model rules comments talks about explaining matters. You gotta explain, of course, as we mentioned, the prospects, prospects of success, the likelihood of success, the likelihood of failure. You've got to talk about that, how generally you're going to proceed. But the model rules point out, quote, a lawyer ordinarily will not be expected to describe trial or negotiation strategy in detail, will not ordinarily be expected to describe these things in detail. What are some things, some details you might want to talk about? Well, what about expensive details? You know, what if it would be helpful, but maybe not essential to have a expert witness and those experts that you're considering are very expensive for the client? That kind of expense, you're going to want to go over that with the client, go over the pros and cons of incurring that expense and get the client to make an informed decision. The client's best interest, of course, is the overriding concern here. That's always the concern in any of these rules that don't involve a client involved in fraud or wrongdoing. And likewise, when it comes to communication, the client's best interest are what you have to keep in mind. Think about two different kinds of clients here. First, let's talk about a client who might have a diminished capacity. This perhaps could be a minor, maybe you're representing a child, or maybe it's someone with a, a mental disability or some other diminished capacity. On the other hand, think about a client who is not flesh and bone, but instead is an entity. Maybe you're talking about a corporation, maybe you're talking about a trade group, maybe you're talking about a limited liability company, maybe you're talking about a firm, Maybe you're talking about a church or synagogue. Maybe you're talking about a government unit, a county, or something that's not flesh and bone. Let's look at those two clients and let's talk about some communication issues that might arrive there. First, when we talk about a client who is a minor or under a disability, when it comes to communications, there may be some communication barriers there, right? It's your duty as the lawyer to overcome those communication barriers with the goal being the client's best interest. The goal also being to respect the dignity of the client and to retain as many rights as possible for that client. There are various stages of diminished capacity. Sometimes a client needs a certain level of help, but doesn't need a full guardianship. What do I mean by that? Sometimes a client can make certain decisions for themselves, but not others. Maybe they need just you as a lawyer and some more detailed talk, or maybe they need just you as a lawyer, some detailed talk that occurs with their permission in the presence of a loved one who has experience in breaking down the particular disability barriers to communication for that particular client. Maybe it's a child and mom really communicates well. Maybe it's a diminished capacity elderly adult and a particular caregiver has found a way to communicate well. On a greater extreme, you may feel the need and the rules defer to your professional judgment on this. You may feel the need to get someone appointed as a guardian to help this individual not only communicate with you, but to make appropriate decisions. So when it comes to communication and it comes to those who are minors or of a diminished capacity, these are some of the issues you will see in practice and you'll see in a multi-state professional responsibility exam. So that's 
that category of communication, the other category of communication I mentioned, talked about when you represent a client who's not flesh and bone, a client who is a corporation, for example, an organization, a church, a synagogue, a county, a city, a government agency, a trade group, what have you. There, when it comes to communication, you're not responsible for informing every single member of the group. And indeed, in most instances, it would be inappropriate to inform every single member of the group. One of the things you may find, because you'll have a duty of loyalty to the organization as a client, that there will be members of the organization with whom your duty of loyalty and the organization's goals are perfectly aligned, but there'll be members of the organization who are not perfectly aligned with the goals of the organization and with your fiduciary duties. So you may find yourself in the opposite situation where you have a duty not to inform or communicate specifically with those particular individuals because of the lack of uniformity of interest. Generally speaking, when you're representing a corporation or a trade group or a church or some other not flesh and bone client that is an organization or a group, typically there is a management structure and you can clarify with the organization who is your point person in that management structure. And that's the person with whom you can satisfy your obligations for communication when it comes to communicating with the organization. There are many other things of concern other than communication when it comes to representing an organization or a group or an entity or a corporation or a church or a county or some other client that's not flesh and bone. So many concerns that there are separate model rules addressing some of those concerns. We will be covering those model rules and those concerns in a later lecture. But for now, when we talk about communication, I'd be remiss to point out two issues that arise all the time. Over communicating, telling too many members or the wrong members of the organization and failing to communicate because you're thinking, well, you know, it's an organization and I'm the lawyer, I know what's best for it. I, I have the knowledge, therefore the knowledge is imputed to the organization. I don't have to talk to anybody else. I don't have to tell anybody else. No, 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 no. That is a mistake, that is not true. So there can be many MPRE scenarios that would test you on those common mistakes. And likewise, in practice, you could be tempted to make those errors yourself. So with that in mind, the last thing I wanna talk about comes to communication is the opposite of communication, withholding information. Imagine, if you will, for whatever reason, you're in front of a tribunal of competent jurisdiction and the presiding judge or hearing officer enters a legally valid order that says, don't tell your client this or don't tell your client that. It's extreme, but it can happen. If it does, which do you obey? Do you obey the court or do you obey these model rules that say to communicate? And the answer is, according to the commentary and the model rules, and the commentary is right, the answer is you obey the court order. Obey the court order. Obey. Do what the court order said. So there can be a duty outside the rules that says don't communicate. And if it is a court of competent jurisdiction and it is a legally valid order, obey. Obey that order. So that's something you can see in practice, probably not very often, but you can see on something like the NPRE. So it's something you need to know about. And the last part of our theme when it comes to pulling rules from chapter one, is so we're gonna pull the rule chapter 1.8, at least insofar as subsection H of our model rules. And what subsection H in rule 1.8 talks about, it talks about Malpractice, it talks about negligence. It talks about the failure to be competent and diligent. So when it comes to competent and diligent representation, this is what Professor Hayden was talking about when he says incompetence and its consequences. One of those consequences can be a suit for negligence, could be a claim for malpractice. That unfortunately, can happen. Hopefully, knock on wood, will never happen to you. But one issue we want to talk about is what if we make an agreement in advance 
about this unlikelihood of a claim of malpractice. For example, maybe you know you're never going to commit malpractice, but you don't want to be caught up in litigation about it. Maybe you want your client to sign an arbitration agreement. Maybe you want them to agree before you accept them as a client, agree in advance that they're going to arbitrate any such claims instead of filing suit against you. Is that allowed under the model rules? Yes. Yes, that is allowed if, if the requirements are followed. The client who's not yet a client, they're a potential client, and you're asking that potential client to limit their right to bring a malpractice action, such as with a binding arbitration agreement. That is allowed so long as the potential client is independently represented in making the agreement. We're not talking about represented by you. We're talking about represented by somebody else in the negotiation with you for them to become your client. So just so you understand it better, hypothetically, you're meeting with a potential new client. The attorney-client relationship is contemplated but not consummated. And you think you want them, this potential new client, to sign in advance a binding arbitration agreement. You have to tell that potential new client, I need you to go hire a lawyer and be represented on this issue of signing my contract for my representation because within my contract is a clause that says you're going to binding arbitration if you feel there was malpractice. That's what you're required to do under the model rules. I've never done it because that would be a really awkward conversation, <laughs> would it not? But it is allowed if you do it properly. So the model rules say you can you can make a contract prospectively, and that contract limits your liability for malpractice so long as the client is independently represented when you make the deal. Now, what about an after-the-fact situation? God forbid, hope it never happens to any of us. The client comes forward and says, hey, you blew the statute of limitations. You were negligent in some other way. You caused me financial harm. Can you say, you know, I'm sorry and I want to make this right. It looks like you would have won $100,000. I'll write you a check for $100,000. Do we have a deal? Can you say that? Is that permissible under the model rule? The client has a reasonable opportunity to seek legal counsel a reasonable opportunity to seek legal counsel. A reasonable opportunity to seek legal counsel is all that's required if after they're your client, you're, God forbid, trying to settle a malpractice claim with them. That's different than the potential client and you're gonna limit your liability for malpractice. The potential client, you remember, had to actually be represented. The current client where you're making the settlement offer, God forbid, to resolve the malpractice claim, they just have to have an adequate opportunity to be represented. They might decline that adequate opportunity. They might make the deal unrepresented, but you've got to give an adequate opportunity for them to be represented. See the difference there when it comes to prospectively limiting your liability and retrospectively trying to settle a claim of liability? The difference is prospectively, they've got to be represented. Retrospectively, they have to have an opportunity to be represented. So that's our chapter one focus of our theme, competent, diligent representation. But we've got just a little bit more that we want to incorporate within this theme. As you remember, we're not only talking about chapter one here. We're also going to talk about some other rules such as part of chapter three, which talks about being an advocate. But we're going to look at 3.8, talks about the duties of a prosecutor. Once we go over those, we're going to make one last return to chapter five. Chapter five, we're going to look at 5.1 and 5.2, talked about the duties of a supervisor in 5.1 and the duties of a lawyer being supervised, a subordinate in rule 5.2. So with that return to the roadmap in mind, let's go ahead and focus again upon our theme 
and this time with a focus on Rule 3.8. Model Rule 3.8 doesn't apply to every lawyer. Matter of fact, it doesn't apply to any lawyer who is not a criminal prosecutor. We're talking about criminal law prosecutions and the role of a prosecutor. Now, there are other types of lawyers who are bringing claims on behalf of entities that look a lot like prosecutors. For example, as a bar grievance defense attorney, I deal with bar counsel is how uh, Florida lawyers prefer to be called when they're representing the Florida bar and they're prosecuting grievances against Florida lawyers. Typically, we refer to them as bar counsel. It's a type of prosecution for sure, but it's not a criminal law prosecution. When we look at this model rule 3.8, we're talking specifically about the criminal law and criminal law prosecutors. And we burden those prosecutors with higher rules, regulations, and standards under the model rules than any other type of lawyer when it comes to these particular things. One of the things we burden them with is that they have to have a personal belief in the likelihood of guilt. A personal belief in the likelihood of guilt of the accused. That's a higher standard than any other type of lawyer. Any other type of lawyer has to bring a non-frivolous argument for success has to make a good faith argument that is not frivolous. Can a lawyer who's not a criminal prosecutor think in their heart of hearts, you know, I can win and prove liability, but in my heart of hearts, I'm not exactly sure in this civil law case that my adversary's client really should be financially liable, but I think I have a good faith argument as to why they could and I know it's not frivolous, and I think I can win. Can that civil law lawyer bring that civil law claim? Yes, absolutely. That would not subject the civil law lawyer to sanctions. That would not subject them to discipline under the model rules of professional conduct. Compare that, if you will, to the criminal law context. What if the prosecutor believes that they've got enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the guilt of the accused? But in their heart of hearts, the prosecutor believes that this person really isn't guilty. Stated somewhat differently, the criminal law prosecutor believes they've got a winning case, but doesn't believe that the criminally accused actually committed the crime. Can that prosecutor bring the claim? The answer is no. It is not proper to bring such a prosecution. That criminal law prosecutor would be subject to discipline. So that's a higher standard. Here's another example that comes from Rule 3.8 of a higher standard. The criminal prosecutor has to make reasonable efforts to assure that the accused has been advised the right to obtain counsel and had an opportunity to obtain counsel. Now, compare that higher standard of the criminal prosecutor that I just mentioned to the usual standard for the civil lawyer. What if a civil lawyer has a client but no opposing counsel? The civil lawyer has an opposing party, but that opposing party is not represented by anyone or any lawyer. Stated somewhat differently, that opposing party is pro se. Does the civil lawyer have an obligation to make sure the pro se adversary has an opportunity to get a lawyer? And the answer is no. Not for that civil lawyer. That is not one of the civil lawyer's duties. But under this rule 3.8 that applies only to criminal law prosecutors, the criminal prosecutor has a higher standard than that civil lawyer has. The criminal law prosecutor has to make reasonable efforts to assure that the accused knows of their right to counsel and the procedure for getting that right to counsel. So that's a higher standard. Here's another example under Rule 3.8 of a higher standard that applies to criminal law prosecutors and only to criminal law prosecutors. The criminal law prosecutor must refrain from getting a waiver of pretrial rights from an unrepresented criminal defendant. So, again, by comparison, imagine not a criminal law prosecutor, but a civil lawyer in a civil suit, not representing the state, not in a criminal matter, not seeking a criminal prosecution.
can that civil lawyer in that civil suit against a pro se party have the pro se waive some pretrial rights? Yes, that's not going to subject the civil lawyer to discipline. But if that were a criminal case and that were a criminal law prosecutor, that would subject the criminal law prosecutor to discipline under Rule 3.8. It's a higher standard. Here's another example of a higher standard that you see under Rule 3.8 that applies only to criminal law prosecutors. The requirement of a timely disclosure of exculpatory evidence. Even without a request. The criminal law prosecutor who's aware of exculpatory evidence has the affirmative burden to come forward and bring that evidence to the attention of the criminal accused and the criminal accused attorney, if the criminal accused has an attorney, and an affirmative duty to bring that evidence forth and share it with the defense, even if the defense hasn't specifically asked for it. To help illustrate what that means, I refer you again to a hypothetical comparison of the criminal law prosecutor with the civil law attorney. Imagine, if you will, a civil law attorney is sitting at a civil law deposition and the opposing counsel didn't ask the right questions and didn't learn about the exculpatory evidence. For that civil law attorney, does that civil law attorney have a duty to ask the right questions at the deposition or thereafter to bring the exculpatory evidence to the civil law attorney's opposing counsel's attention? The answer is no. Indeed, if the civil law attorney were to do so in most, if not all circumstances, that would be a breach of the duty of loyalty owed to the civil law attorney's client in our adversary system particularly in the civil part of it, we rely upon the diligence and competence of each attorney and we don't transform the opposing counsel into a policeman that springs to life to the detriment of their own client in order to help their opposing counsel. No, 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 not in the civil law context. But when it comes to exculpatory evidence in the criminal law context, and when it comes to the affirmative duties under Model Rule 3.8 for the criminal law prosecutor, the criminal law prosecutor, despite the detriment to his own case or her own case or to the state's case, has an affirmative duty to bring forth the exculpatory evidence and bring it to the attention of the criminally accused and the accused attorney. So that is a higher standard for the criminal law prosecutor. Another example of a higher standard imposed under Rule 3.8 upon criminal law prosecutors and criminal law prosecutors exclusively under Rule 3.8 is to use reasonable care to make sure that extrajudicial statements made by investigators and other part of members of the prosecutor's office are not inappropriate. And that's not particularly different from the duty of the civil lawyer, but it is a somewhat higher standard. And the last higher standard I would point out, and again, this one's not radically different than the civil, is that the criminal prosecutor should not subpoena a lawyer and try to get testimony from a lawyer unless there's really no other alternative. And you know, the civil lawyer probably shouldn't do that either, but the civil lawyer has more leeway to make the argument that the subpoena is necessary for the civil case than the criminal law prosecutor has when it comes to the criminal case because that rule 3.8 says that this is an affirmative duty of the prosecutor. So when it comes to competent, diligent representation, I wanted to cover all these heightened duties under rule 3.8 of the prosecutor because the prosecutor who doesn't abide by these heightened duties, that prosecutor certainly is not giving competent and diligent representation. Stated somewhat differently, that prosecutor is failing in that prosecutor's duties and no one wants to be accused of such a thing. So whether or not 
you ever become a prosecutor, you'll need to know those differences for the model rules of professional conduct, those differences in Rule 3.8. You're going to need to know them for the MPRE. And who knows? may come in handy someday in your practice, no matter what type of practice you might have. So I wanted to cover them under today's theme of competent and diligent representation. Now to round out today's theme of competent, diligent representation, going back to our roadmap, we've already covered those parts of chapter one and just wrapped up that rule 3.8 that applies to prosecutors. The last part of the roadmap we want to talk about is ABA model rule five, which we return to from our prior lectures. We're going to talk about law firms and associations, and this is going to bring to mind model rule 5.1 and model rule 5.2. As I mentioned, they're kind of two sides of the same coin insofar as model rule 5.1 talks about the duties of a lawyer who is supervising. Model rule 5.2 talks about the duties of a lawyer who's being supervised. So let's look at those various duties. One of the things that's always true for any kind of boss or supervisor under these model rules is to not be negligent when it comes to not being negligent, the way the model rules spell out the requirement is one of using uh, reasonable efforts to ensure, reasonable efforts to ensure the competence of those they supervise and that those they supervise are competent. Reasonable efforts to assure that those they supervise are not violating the model rules of professional conduct themselves. So the gist of 5.1 responsibilities of partners, managers, and supervisory lawyers is that you've got to use reasonable efforts. There are times in the rule 5.1 where the supervisor, the partner, or the manager, managerial lawyer becomes responsible under professionalism, becomes subject to discipline for the professional shortcomings and violations of someone they supervised. When does that happen? Well, obviously, if the lawyer orders someone to go violate a rule, then that supervisor, manager, or partner who did the ordering is as guilty and as liable as the subordinate who followed the order. Just giving the order, even if it's not followed, would be a violation of Rule 5.1 of the model rules of professional conduct. But even if you didn't give the order, if you're the supervisor and you're the boss, manager, partner, whatever, of that particular subordinate who violated the rule, and you learn about the violation, and you ratify, or you fail to take remedial measures after learning about it, then you too share in the liability under the model rules for that shortcoming. And that makes sense. You learned about it, you shouldn't have ratified it. You learned about it, you should have taken remedial measures if they're available. So you become liable if you didn't. Some issues to point out is that you've got to have procedures in place. If you're a supervisor, if you're a manager, if you're a partner who's supervising others. You've got to have procedures in place to assure that these things don't happen, to find out if they do, and to give yourself that chance to take remedial measures if they do. You know, God forbid there ever be any malpractice or negligence. Insure against, you know, what's the replacement for the loss of your law license? There certainly isn't an insurance policy anywhere that's going to pay you the value of a law license that you lost because you were disbarred. That's not an insurable event in any of the 50 states, District of Columbia, or the U.S. territories. So you can't just buy insurance and not worry about it. You've got to be proactive. You've got to do something about it. The flip side of that coin would be Rule 5.2, as we mentioned, these are the duties of a lawyer being supervised. Under Model Rule 5.2, can the lawyer being supervised just say, hey, uh, my partner told me to do it, so therefore I'm not responsible. The general rule is 
No. The general rule is the supervised lawyer can't escape being subject to discipline simply because the partner, the manager, the supervisor commanded that action to be done. But perhaps surprisingly, there are exceptions where that is a defense and those are identified in the official comments to official model rule 5.2. So let's look at those because those would be ripe for testing on the multi-state professional responsibility exam. So let's take a look at those. One of those we want to look at is if the question is reasonably arguable as to whether or not it is a violation of the model rules of professional conduct to do this or not do this, if it's reasonably arguable, then somebody's got to make the call. If it's reasonably arguable. I'm not talking about something that's clearly a violation. If it's clearly a violation, it's not reasonably arguable. I'm not talking about something where you're personally not sure whether it's a violation. Just because you're personally not sure doesn't make it reasonably arguable. Look it up. Do the research. Ask around. Read the case law. Find the answer. I'm talking about something where, despite doing all of that, there still really is no answer. It's reasonably arguable as to whether to do A or whether to do B. If that scenario exists, then the subordinate lawyer can use as a defense the fact that somebody had to make the call and it was my direct supervisor who's also a member of the bar and this is what my supervisor told me to do. That's a defense and that can be tested on the multi-state professional responsibility exam. How about in actual practice? How about in real life? What do you do there? Well, the scenario that we just spelled out from the official comment, that could be a real life scenario, but I have a better suggestion. I'm happy to take a call from my fellow lawyer. When I get a call from my fellow lawyer, I try to stop right then and there and take the call from my fellow lawyer out of respect. And if my fellow lawyer is asking me a genuine question, I do my best to give him a direct answer right then and there. And I do my best not to charge him for that call if reasonably I can do so. Because it's professional courtesy. You know, learn to the bar itself. Now, this is an option here in the state of Florida where I'm talking to you from, but this may not be an option in every jurisdiction. But I know in the state of Florida, we have what's called the Florida Bar Ethics Hotline, and many jurisdictions have them. In Florida, it's a 1-800. It's a toll-free number. And they answer the phone, usually between 9 to 5. Sometimes they take a message and call you back. Sometimes it's the same day. Sometimes it's the next. But in my experience and the experience of others, usually they are reasonably responsive. The requirements here in Florida is that you be a member of the Florida Bar if you're calling, that you're calling about yourself. You're not asking about Oh, hey, what he did, what she did, was that okay? You've got to be calling about yourself, and you've got to be calling about your own future contemplated conduct. So after you've made the call, you can't call the Florida Bar Hotline and find out if you got it right. They're not dealing in hypotheticals. So they're dealing about a current member of the bar who's unsure of his or her own duties and responsibilities under the Florida rules regulating the Florida Bar. And based on their own future conduct, they want to go over it with a bar ethics attorney. And I've called them on a regular basis. You should too. I found some really super helpful people answering those phones. They'll give you firm advice and they'll send you in the direction of where their authority came from for giving that advice. They'll cite you the rule. If there's precedent, they'll tell you the precedent. It's a great big help. So it's something I would recommend. And that is a summary of Model Rule 5.2. Uh, another issue that arises there under 5.2 has to do with this particular example. I want to use this example that's given to us in the official commentary of the Model Rule. It says, for example, if a question arises whether the interests of two clients conflict under Rule 1.7, in other words, whether there's a conflict of interest, you've got a conflict out, you can't get involved in that representation. If a question arises whether the interests of two clients conflict under Rule 1.7, the supervisor's reasonable resolution of the question should protect the subordinate professionally if that resolution is subsequently challenged. So that's an exact quote from the model rules, and it's an example of the model rules saying when the subordinate can use the order from the supervisor 
as a defense to the subordinate being subject to discipline. So that's a diligent representation. I hope by clumping these disparate rules from three different chapters into that theme that it helps you to understand them better. And I hope that you're never personally accused of incompetence or lack of diligence. I hope that you will always be a zealous, effective, diligent, and competent representative of your client. Until we meet again, may God continue to bless us all. And I will see you shortly in lesson nine. Thank you.